Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph LaBella. And I'm Ron Sen. And tonight it's Guestapalooza, which you'll see in a little bit. First, I want to talk about political correctness. Now, the political correctness issue has come up with the possible renaming of the Washington Redskins. That's what they've always been. The fans there are committed to that. The Skins fans could not be more rabid, but there's a big movement in Washington to rename the team. Additionally, there's a bill in Congress which hasn't really gone anywhere to rename the team. Of course, it's not the only team that might not have a politically correct name. For example, the Fighting Irish. It doesn't say the pleasingly correct Irish. Well, I mean, they have a mascot who, who looks pretty much out of control. And then you have the Fighting Sioux of South Dakota. In fact, they're famous because apparently they have the, like, an incredible college hockey rink that's over $100 million that was donated to them, decorated with numerous Native American ar artifacts. And when people went to the administration and said, we want to you know, rename the, the team, the donor of the hockey rink said, yeah, fine, you can rename the team. I'm taking my hockey rink back. I'd like to know how many people want to change the name of the Redskins. Well, they and actually... two people. Actually, they did a poll. You, totally great segue into it. And four out of five people say, no, they don't want to rename the Washington Redskins. Now, what is Melrose? Melrose is the Red Raiders with you know, Native American sim symbol. When I grew up in Wakefield, it was the Warriors. If we look at Army helicopters, you have the Black Hawk, Apache, Comanche, and Iroquois, because Native Americans were valued for their tremendous warrior spirit. So I guess it depends on how you look at it. If, if you try to make a parody of any race, ethnic group, whatever, and you know, insult them, make fun of them, you know, on the other hand, if, if you respect a culture for what they really do, you know, the Mongolian hordes, great horsemen and warriors from the past, Genghis Khan and the like, you know, Mongolian horde, I guess that's a bad thing, or is it a good thing? I don't know. Yeah, but, but I, I mean, that's been going on for a while. If, if, if people have problems with, again, the Redskins, you have, uh, like you said, it's 20%, right. 20% of the people, and most of the time they get their way. You know, it always works out for them, it seems like. You know, it's all about being politically correct. It, it's kind of a shame at times. Well, speaking about being politically correct, one guy who wasn't politically correct this week was Jason Collins, former Celtic, more recently Washington Wizard, and Collins acknowledged that he was gay. In an article that came out in Sports Illustrated with the title, The Gay Athlete. To me, a lot of the articles are saying Jason Collins admitted he was gay. Well, I, I didn't know that it was a crime for him to be gay, so he just acknowledged that he was gay. And the, the response overall has been very interesting um, because there's been a, a lot of different facets to it. Uh, sports journalist Tim Brando kind of reacted to it and says, well, why is it that you know, if I'm a middle-aged white guy, I'm disenfranchised now because it's, it's better to be gay and black. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> you know, if it were such a great deal to be gay, why is he the only athlete yeah. that's ever come out? The only, that's where I'm uncomfortable about the whole thing. Why are you making a big deal of it? I mean, it's in the papers. They say he's going to make a ton of money now from endorsements. I mean, no, really, no one cares. You know, no one cares. And, it, and that's another thing. They shouldn't be making a big deal of it because it's something that, you know, everybody, I don't know if people have to, in the past, have to adjust to it, but now it's not even an adjustment. You know, people are gay, people are straight, and that's it. Right. And who cares, as long as they're a good person. Right. There's a, there's a transition in society where conventional or traditional wisdom has been challenged, especially in younger age people. Um, we've all known people that we played sports with that were gay, and it wasn't a big deal. Because it's not, as a team, and I think the point that most of the athletes are making is, if a guy's working hard, he's a great teammate, He's doing everything he can do to help you be, or she can do to make you successful. That's all you can ask for. You know, I think it's the press. They, they need something to write about. They want to make it as big a story as they can just to keep them, a, you know, people reading the newspapers or watching TV. And, and that's where it's all coming from because 
the, the normal everyday person, they don't care. I mean, I work directly with a gay person who's a great guy. He's a great guy. I don't even think of him that way. And that's the way it is nowadays. No one thinks, oh, he's gay, he's straight. They don't think of that anymore. Well, there were a lot of good discussions on TNT with a group of athletes, Shaq, Kenny Smith, Barkley, and so forth. And Kenny Smith made a great point. He said, all my life as a black man, I've fought for inclusiveness. So how could I come out and not be supportive of somebody who, who just wants to be included? And Barkley said, anybody who thinks there's never been gay players before in the NBA is nuts. He says, I've played with people who I'm sure are gay, but it was just not a big deal. And yet, um, th there's going to be a lot of other points of view, uh, too. And a good one is that not everyone's going to agree with it. And just because they don't agree with a certain lifestyle doesn't mean that they're a terrible person. It just means that's their belief. You know, if you want to persecute someone because they're of a different group, then it's not OK. But if, if you want to disagree with it, I think it's important to accept people's right to disagree. Right. You, you, they talk about tolerance. You have to have tolerance on the other side, too. You know, people that are uncomfortable for whatever reason. But, you know, nowadays, I mean, I remember when I was young, when I was like 10 years old, and now, the way I look at things now, I mean, you look at Paul Pierce. Do you look at him as a black person? I don't. No, no one does anymore. They just, just, you know, if he's, I mean, you don't look at, you don't look at a, well, a, I think a you black tend or white person and say that's a black or white right. person you can, anymore. Right, you can be somewhat colorblind. When you're watching sports, you can say that man or woman can play, or they, you don't think they can play. It, it, you don't say, oh gosh, the, guy, the uh, shortstop on Toronto is black or white. Who, I mean, you just don't see them that but way. But most of the younger people in high school, the kids, I mean, they, they think the same way that I do now. I didn't think the same way when I was 10 years old that I think now, you know, and, um, in, well, probably in the last 20 or 30 years with me, you know, I don't, I don't care. As long as, as long as they're a nice person, that's what counts. But I don't look at people, until someone says that, that you know, when they talk about, say, an Afro-American, I don't even think of them being, you know, I just, like Paul Pierce, I don't even look at him that way. And that most, most players, you know, God, any, any player. Well, I mean, that's the way it is nowadays, but until people bring up, oh, he's gay now, and then start, people start talking about that. Well, and there's some irony in that the Celtics were the first team to have an all-black starting five. They were the first team to have a black coach when Bill Russell was there. And now they have the first team, or one of the first teams, obviously, that had an acknowledged gay player. And I did like what uh, Barkley said. He said, this is an important day for the NBA. The NBA has always been about breaking down barriers, and um, this is certainly a barrier that needed to be broken down. But as far as we we're all concerned, there really wasn't a barrier there. You know, when you think about 99.9% .9 of the people, you know what I mean? Well, he's got a lot better chance probably to play in the NBA next year yeah. because of this, because he's, he's really at the tail end of his career. He, he's kind of a one or two point a game, one or two rebound a game, a guy who's a leader in the, cl in the uh, clubhouse locker room who sets good screens plays pretty good defense, but, he, but he's not a star NBA player. You know what I really enjoyed reading? How much all the players loved him, the type of guy he is. I mean, every one of them said he's a great teammate, a great person. I mean, every, every person that knows him has said this, that's the first thing they say about him. I mean, but, you know, I, I kind of feel bad for the girl he was engaged with, you right. know, when she dated him for eight years. She wanted to have a family. You know, I didn't want to get that deep into it, but... Um, it was almost like she felt it was almost like a lie for eight years. Right. Well, I think he was so, struggling with his identity. Yeah. It doesn't make him a bad person. He, he just uh, really had trouble coping with a tough situation. And when you consider he's a twin, and his, even his, his brother didn't know. It, but it's the good thing, Ron, the, you know, he's the first one who came out. And from what I hear, he's, one, he's a great person. So that's good to know. Well, he's made $32 million in NBA salary. So hopefully he can put together a few more shekels and do okay for himself. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey, this is Paul Rabel from the Boston Cannons, and you're watching Let's Talk Sports. Welcome back. Joining us in this segment is Lou, the sports guru Spagnola, singer and a musician extraordinaire, and again, the man with more Facebook friends than people I know. Uh, that's good. At least you're going to tell the truth about me for once. How many lies can you tell about a person in one sentence? First. At the beginning of the year, the Boston Bruins were destined to win the Stanley Cup. By the end of the season, 
local fans have pretty much buried them. But one game into the postseason, they're 1-0. Hey, what can you say? You know, a week ago they took more hits than a piñata at a festival. And now all of a sudden, there they are. Look at that game last night. Did they not look unbelievable? They look like two years ago. They dominated the game. And what I enjoyed was this third period. I mean, basically, the second half of the season, they've been blown. I think two-thirds of the games they were winning in the third period, they blew it. They had to go into overtime. But that's only one game. What do you look for for, for the next game? Same thing. You know why? Because I'll tell you what, if they revert back to what they ended the season on, it's going to be a short series with anybody. I think anybody, I, I, even Toronto, no matter who you line them up against. You know, and I mean, I look, never mind the Western Conference, teams like Chicago or even Detroit that squeaked into the playoffs. I can't see the Bruins, if they, the way they ended the season. You know, it, the, one thing, though, i got to say is Tuka Rask, I think, took a lot of unnecessary heat. I mean, the guy could win the Vezina for all the crap he took from people that don't know the game. I mean, you know, he, uh, the, his own defenseman couldn't clear the front of the net. He was constantly, he didn't know what way to go. You know, he's getting blocked by his own players. And I, I don't think the intensity was there. That was the biggest thing. The biggest problem for me was the intensity. Like, they'd get to the third period and just kind of be like on the periphery of, well, you know, I, I don't know. It was like they knew that they were going to make the playoffs. Well, I, I don't see this team going really far for one reason. They're so sloppy with the puck in their own end. And against good teams in low-scoring games, that's going to cost you. They're not going to score four, games, four goals a game or three goals a game. So one silly mistake is going to catch up with them sooner or later. Oh. Well, if you remember when they won the Stanley Cup, they ended up lousy, too, at the end of the year. Weren't they something like 8-14 and 14 or something like that? Yeah, and they, they did end they ended the season on a down note. But you know something? That, I mean, obviously, Tim Thomas was great during the season. He was even better in the playoffs. And, uh, you know, people forget we were t a two to one lead was safe with that team. You know, you didn't you didn't get that. It reminded me of the early 2000 Patriots, where if they were up at a touchdown, they had the defense that would just shut you down for the rest of the game. You know, the, the Bruins, the last couple of months, it's like a two goal late lead was never safe with them. Well, you know? it's fading in the third period and more than anything else, stupid play bad penalties, people knocking the puck out of the, their own end into the stands twice oh, in yeah, final that, minutes costing him games. Yeah, and Tuka Rask is not as consistent as Thomas. No, definitely either, not. So I don't know. He's not as good. Absolutely not. You know, but I don't think he's the fault. You know, that's, that's the problem. I think, like you said, sloppiness, general, just inconsistent play, yeah. spotty effort. And, you know, I, but to me, though, tape to tape pass, you know, it, they a couple of years ago they were getting it right on the blade, right from the right from the blade to someone else's blade. Their passing was crisp. They looked like a West Coast team. Well, maybe they'll get it going. They did it when they won the Stanley Cup. Every series it got better and better. That Philadelphia series, you knew after that series they had a good chance of winning it. I think it made men and out of them. They came together. But the problem here is, is that yeah, he's not the problem, but he doesn't help at times when they need it. No, he's he not gonna. When a team, when players make mistakes, he's not good enough. To bail him out, where well, Thomas was. I agree with that. I, I don't so, think I mean, he's, that's uh, a problem they have. I don't well, know that he's going to cost them the series, but I don't know that he's good enough to win it for them either if it comes down to him. Well, the other thing is that, you know, for us aging fans, getting clicker thumb back and forth, Red Sox, Celtics, Bruins, it, it's, it's really hard on the hands. Yeah, well, you know, it's hard on, the, I guess it's, it's hard to be humble if you're a Boston sports fan. You know? <laughs> no, what are you going to do, though, you know? It could be worse. At least our team, you know, we don't have to worry about singing Hail to the Red Tails. You know? Well, unbelievably enough, the New York Knicks, Knicks dressed in black for the Celtics' funeral last night. Unfortunately, they forgot to show up once the game started. Uh, whose decision was that? I mean, what are the owners thinking about? They let the players do what they want? Well, Woodson didn't know, he, he, he said. Well, it's I, the I, right, exactly. And, you know, you have, you have well, players that have on the Celtics that have won a world championship, have been to the conference finals and NBA finals. They, they have plenty of pride. Never kick a sleeping dog. When you have knuckleheads like Smith, <laughs> no. though, and Anthony on your team, I mean, they just cause problems. And, and I don't think they're as good as people say they are. I mean, Anthony very rarely shoots 50%. You know, so most games he's around 41, 42%. If he's going to shoot 30 shots and score 36, I can give that away. The guy you have to watch out for is Smith. 
Well, in any Smith's game, Smith's going to cause him. He's a guy who can really. He's cause a guy that can win the series. In for any you, game, you. when you have a team that shoots as many three pointers as the Knicks do, anything can happen. And I was surprised in researching this the other day. Almost 25 percent of shots in the NBA now are three pointers. It, the game has totally moved outside, and because it's been effective enough for for teams to score that way. When you have that one play that teams have to double team and you swing the ball properly, you're going to get wide open three-point shots the whole game. If you don't have that one play, which the Celtics don't have anymore, they oh. don't have that one play before you double-team PS. They don't double-team PS no. anymore. You know, and you need that, you need that double-team to swing the ball. But teams well, like Anthony, when, play, when they double-team Anthony, the ball swings for the wide open three. Well, take some guys like Stephon Curry, who, who basically takes threes the whole game long. And, you know, obviously he's a terrific shooter. And, uh, just like his dad, Del Curry, was, and it's, that's his game. You know, you talk about the old days, though. Could you ever picture 20 years ago if somebody said that a player is going to take 12 to 15 three-point shots during a game, you would say, come on. You'd be like, get out of here. That's never going to happen. And you know what? The paint now, it's, it, you know how it is. Every era, there's a different kind of thing going on. I mean, you know, in the 90s was kind of like the New York street ball era. Everybody slam dunked. You went through the paint all the time. Then you had a team like Detroit Pistons that didn't let you in the paint. If you've got a great defensive team that doesn't let you penetrate, well, okay, then you have to shoot. And then a lot of teams just couldn't shoot back you've then. You've got to attack the pick and roll. In the NBA, if you don't attack Absolutely. the pick and roll, yeah. forget about it. And the Celtics were getting killed on that last the, night. The other issue is, you know, for example, the WNBA has moved out the, the three-point line to beyond, I think, 22 feet. But it doesn't matter because people, if you move it out two feet, people will still shoot from out there. But you're, uh, you touched upon something I was going to say because I'll tell you, I think like every sport, you know, they want to tinker with should we raise the mound, should we lower the mound, should we bring the fences in in baseball, in football, the two-point thing, you know. Basketball, how long until they say, okay, we got to move the three-point arc out because now it's bombs away. And they're going to say, okay, well, we want to do this. But right now, I think it's because baseball, football are always going to be up here in the ratings. And then you got to figure, you know, hockey's here and basketball's here. If basketball was to get up to here again, like the 80s, the Magic and Larry thing, you got to wonder about that. They're going to start tinkering with things, moving the free throw back. You know, there's a lot of things thinking that goes with that. Well, there were some interesting statistics that came out. In addition to the fact that no teams ever come back from a 3-0 deficit in the NBA, I think they said that there have been 104 teams in that 3-0 deficit, and only 11 have made it back to 3-2. 3-2. So, you think 3-3-3? 3 made it. I didn't hear that, what the I statistic think. was. But, yeah. it's, you know, and the NBA has the greatest home court advantage of any sport. It's 68% uh, home team wins. And, you know, it's easy to see how, especially with the officiating, which is usually <laughs> heavily toward the home team. You know what I worry yeah. about is, though, is Paul Pierce. He played 44 minutes again yesterday, and he's just playing too many minutes. Well, down the stretch, you know, they, you know they'd have Pierce going one-on-one. -on -one. You know he's going to back out and, and take a step back. The other team knows he's going to back out and take the step back. His legs were gone. The shots were flat. And then, you know. you know what I couldn't figure out the other day? They have Pierce, right? I guess it was tied at the end of what, 12 seconds ago. So they come out and set a pick for Pierce. Now, with four seconds ago, Chandler picks him up. How stupid is that? Pierce can't go to the basket like he used to go. You know, now he's got to take a jump shot over Chandler where he had kid on him. They well, should have left him one-on-one -on -one with like kid. It's like we said before, when uh, Baylor lost to Louisville in the women's play, Brittany Griner's out at half court defending somebody. Why she, you know, if she were underneath waiting for the girl, the girl doesn't get fouled. She doesn't get two free throws. Baylor wins that game. Maybe they get, get back to the national championship. We'll be right back.
athletic evolution, it starts with a purpose and ends with your success. Visit our website or drop into our training facility at 78B Olympia Avenue, Woburn, Mass. Athletic evolution, giving you the edge. Welcome back. Tonight in our sports conversation, we have one of the best Melrose athletes you may not be familiar with. Annalisa DeBarry played on the volleyball state championship team. She's a medal winner at the state championships in gymnastics and an outstanding track and field athlete. Welcome. Thank Welcome, you. Welcome, Glad to be here. Explain what's going on now. You're, you're doing track right now? Yes. Uh, our Middlesex League is almost over. We have our last meet coming up this Tuesday. And what do you do? What, what events? I do the 100 meter hurdles, the triple jump, and the 4x1 relay. Now, when you play sports that are so different, how do you have time to really practice to be your best at each one? Um, I think doing each sport kind of plays into the next one. So being in shape for volleyball helps me with gymnastics, and being in shape for gymnastics helps me with track. So they just kind of play into each other. Now, when you said you do the 4x100, that's not hurdles, right? There's no... no. So you're one of the fastest um, runners, too, sprinters on the team? I guess so, yeah. What's your time in the hurdles? Um, my best time this year is a 15-6, and last year was around the same. How are you doing that? I mean, what's your record in that? Um, I usually come in first, so... Do you? Yeah, in the Middlesex League, anyway. Now, do you compete in states? Now, did you qualify for the states in that? Yeah, I did. The qualifying time is uh, in the 17s, so... And you did what? 15, something, wow. yeah. How's the team doing? Really well. We are undefeated, and we have a lot of talent on the team this year. When's your next meet? Tuesday. Against who? Watertown. How are they? Um, they are not that good. Did you compete against Reading yet? Uh, yeah, we did. And you, you beat them? Yeah. How many meets do you have left? That's what you call it, a meet, right? Yeah. Um, well, the last Middlesex League one is this Tuesday, and then we have states and leagues, and if we make it past that, then we have all states and regionals and nationals. But it's very rare that someone makes it as far as nationals. So. Now, gymnastics has been outstanding here. I think they've won four league championships in a row. Yes. And obviously, there's a great infrastructure. When did you begin? Uh, training in gymnastics? I began training in gymnastics probably when I was six and a half or seven, uh, which is actually late for most gymnasts because they usually start when they're three. Um, but I started when I was pretty young and I started at a pretty intense level and then it built up and then by sixth grade I was practicing four hours a day, six days a week. So Four hours a day, six days a week? Yeah. Now how often do you do that? Right now, I don't do it that anymore. It was too intense. So now I just practice with the high school team, and then over the summer, I do a camp. But I've stopped doing it at such a high level. Now, how many events are there in gymnastics? Four. Four, and everybody has to do all four? Or do you have? No, a lot of people specialize in a couple or just one, and some people do all four. Do you do all four? Yes. Well, if, you know, you're the Middlesex League, reigning Middlesex League all-around champion, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, all-around. She's very modest. She doesn't want to tell us anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, is there a favorite event that you have? Um, I tell people it depends on the day because usually for vault, you need to be, like, really energized or angry or something to do well. And beam and floor, you need to be more, you know, balanced, and obviously you need to be more calm. So it kind of just depends on the day. So I don't have a favorite. Now, you had a champ this year? Um, I got second place this year. Last year you were? Yeah. Well, in the Middlesex League, I got champ both years. And then this year, I went to states, and I got second. Second in state? Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. So, yeah. yeah. So when you talk about recognized athletes, Annalise is extremely well known in the state. Um, as far as volleyball goes, you know, volleyball had spectacular year this season yeah. and many of the girls are playing off-season volleyball. Mm -hmm. um, are you on a team this spring? Yeah, uh, me, Maeve and Cassidy are, are all on the same team and Jill is also playing through the same program as us. And what program is that? Pumas. Okay, yeah. and you know we're expecting a lot of great things from this year's team which, which 
it should be very interesting because you may be able to be a little bit under the radar and sneak up on people too. Yeah, I think a lot of people believe that we're not going to be that good, but we've been practicing with the state championship team every single day during this past season, so I think we have a lot of potential and we. Have what a about lot at to the offer. net? What about at the net? I mean, we have the girls working hard there. Yeah, I know I'm working really hard. That's well, my favorite place to be. Now so. you're an outside hitter. Yeah. Now, where are you going to be playing this year? Were you going to um, be playing the back row, too, maybe? Or I just, want to. I'd like to you've play You've been working hard at that? Yeah. Because you have a lot of competition back there. I know. Yeah. I'd like to do what Jen Kane does, like, all around. Well, it seems there. like the trend over the past few years is more specialization and fewer players that are able to, to play all around, no, which is not, no reflection on the players. It's just the overall talent in the program is so high right now. Yeah. Now, how's your serve? You've been working uh, on that? Yeah, that was probably the one thing I struggled the most with, but that's what I'm working on. So now in Pumas, are you playing front and back? Yeah. Now, how many players do you usually have on a team in Pumas? Ten. But not all of them show up at practice, so, yeah. Now, you really came on as an outside hitter last year. As the year went on, you got better and better, and by the end of the year, you were really successful at the net. How much more have you improved since then, playing with Pumas? Um, I... Probably at hitting and at the net, probably not that much. I've learned different k kinds of sets, so like speeding it up or hitting a different way. But I think that I learned the most through the Melrose season, hands up, like hands down. It's definitely, we practice every day, and it's specialized all like on you. It's all about you. And they really take the time to make sure that you learn from it. So I haven't really learned much more through Pumas. Now, where did you get the great ups? Was it from gymnastics? I think so. Either that or genetics. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> yeah, Annalise, I don't know. What, if, do, do they measure people's vertical jump? In At the, Pumas, they do, actually. Okay, so why don't you tell us what your vertical jump is? I, I'm not sure. I think it's somewhere around in the hundreds, like 110 centimeter, I don't, inches. I don't, I don't know. Like, they said something in the 110, but I know that the guy who measures it was really surprised. I don't know the number, but he was definitely surprised to see that I could jump that high. Well, the point being for our younger athletes is girls can jump. So we expect to <laughs> see you jump as well. Um, but I'm looking for big things. I mean, I just look at y your back row is going to be really good again. Yeah. You are strong as an outside hitter. Um, I, I would think maybe, I know Jill McGinnis has always wanted to play front and back. I don't know what coach is going to do. If, she's gonna, if he's going to leave her as a libero or let yeah. her play front and back. But I, I would think she would be a real good outside hitter, too. Yeah. I know she wanted to do that last year. And you're high in some of the younger girls well, the, in the, the middle. The, it's going to be very interesting because you have uh, a blend of really experienced players. You have three or four players who can compete to be setter. I have my yeah. own opinions on uh, who that will be, and I'll keep those to myself. Yeah. And, and I think Mary Lessing is going to be... A, Know, has, a, has a good chance to be successful in the middle, yeah. um, you know, from what I've seen so far. And I think you got to watch out for some of those upcoming freshmen who you got have some a, of those a lot of eight size. Graders that have size that have been playing a lot this summer, so, uh, well, this spring and right. into the summer. So maybe one of them can help in the middle too. But I think, you know, people are looking at what you lost, but you have a great team coming back. Mm -hmm. and people don't under, a lot of people don't understand that, yeah. and they're underestimating you, mm -hmm. your team. But it's going to be, I mean, we've been watching volleyball for, since our daughters were here, what, 15 years now, 12? Wow. We're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I've no. been watching it for a long time. And, um, well, the team's been to the sectional yeah. championship 10 years in a row, and, and I'm predicting already it's going to be, they're going back again this season. Let's get back to track, though. Explain what you have in front of you now in track. What, what is left in track? I mean, when you go by states, now you, you finish Tuesday. Yeah. So does the whole team get to the states or just individual? Uh, just individually. At that point, it breaks off to just individually. Um, the whole team has leagues coming up, which is everyone in the league, obviously. And then after that, based on your times or your distances, you go to, I believe it's states for Division Three because we are in Division Three. And then it's all like all the state. And then after that, it'll be regionals. And after that, na nationals. So, if you qualify for states yet, or do you have to wait for leagues? I've already qualified for states because. They base it off of your times and distances throughout the season. So you did it on the hurdles. For sure. mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right, now Jason Selk wrote a book called 10 Minute Toughness. And he presents a program for sports psychology to how, how to improve yourself to become mentally tougher. One of his components of that is the, what he calls a highlight reel. So you have a personal highlight reel that you can visualize and play over and over again before a competition. So if you had to select a few highlights that went to your highlight reel from what you did, uh, you've done as an athlete so far, share a couple of those highlights with us. Uh, that's really funny because I do actually shut my eyes and picture myself doing the perfect routine before gymnastics or before volleyball. Um, I'd say for gymnastics I have the most, so I just picture like the routine where I have the straightest legs or the most pointed toes. And this past leagues at gymnastics, I actually got first at, on beam both years, last year and this year, with a uh, 9-7. So I usually just picture those routines, and that helps me. 9-7? Yeah. The max is 10, right? Yeah. You got a 9-7? Mm -hmm. Now, do they, do they score you just like they do in the Olympics? Uh, no. They used to score the Olympics out of 10, but now they've switched the scoring to out of 18 because they add the difficulty score and the execution score. Now, watching gymnastics, a lot of the events look intimidating or just frightening to me. A as a young gymnast, how do you overcome your fear? You know, you're on the okay. beam or, or unevens or whatever. How do you get, get past that? Uh, it's really hard. Um, I would say I just try to tell myself to push that feeling in your stomach out and the first one's always the worst so after that it's smooth sailing usually so I just try to tell myself that once you get the first one over with then the rest will be easy. Do you have any colleges looking at you? Um, not really I've been emailing a few coaches but. What are you interested in what schools? Um, I've been looking at Providence College, BU, I would love to go to Tufts, um, yeah UMass Amherst is a great one. So. UMass Amherst? Mm -hmm. So it, what sport would you hope to play in college? It depends on where I go. Um, I think I could do any sport. I'm not good enough for D1, but I would be happy to play D3 or D2. I could do D2 track at a couple of schools or even club, as long as I'm doing something. I don't mind. Now, where are you as a sprinter? Where are you in the, on the team? Now, you do hurdles, mm -hmm. but when you, when you do the relay, where are you? How many girls are in front of you time-wise? Are you that uh, fast where you could be real good in hurdles? Because, you know, again, you have the ups. I mean, so in hurdles, yeah. it must be a lot easier for you. Um, I'm not really sure what my time specifically is for the sprinting because my time's always linked with the three other people in the relay. But I know that there's four spots, and there's lots of girls who want it, and I'm on one of the four spots. So Do you have a chance? So you have a chance to make it in um, track then yeah. in college. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it's Thank been, you. I mean, definitely one of the best athletes I've seen in Melrose in all the years I've been watching. I mean, to be so Thank successful you. in all three sports. Well, right. There have there've been a lot of athletes that are very good, but you might be a really individually successful athlete, and your team might not be that good. So, uh, to really be able to enjoy both the individual and team success yeah. is fantastic. And it takes so much. I mean, just doing gymnastics, it takes so much time. Well, yeah. I can't believe you're doing that, and then you you got to you have to work on volleyball, and then the yeah. track too. Well, I, I've said it's so many times hectic. that I wondered to you, I wondered whether you thought volleyball was really easy because gymnastics looks so hard to me. I think that volleyball is less physically demanding, but a lot of it is mental, and it's so different that I really struggled with volleyball because it's totally different. Like I was totally confused about having to deal with a ball and having to coordinate with that because with gymnastics it's just like your body, you know. So I think they're both difficult but in different ways. Have you been watching Dancing with the Stars with Allie? No, I haven't. You haven't? I have don't have ever, time. Have you ever met her? I have. I knew her because we went to the same gym for about a year. So. Well, she's doing good on Dancing with the Stars. I would assume <laughs> that. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you. Good luck. Thanks. All right, we expect to see another great season and stay healthy. Yep. We'll be right back. On and off the court, Visionary Basketball Group delivers programs that empower players with skills for athletic and personal success. Our players undergo learning experiences that position them for positive lifelong achievement on and off the court. 
Hello, my name is Anthony Taylor, founder of Visionary Basketball Group, VBG. It's a year-round basketball player development organization ranging from preschool to college and professional level, girls and boys. We cater to all skill levels, starting from beginner, beginner intermediate, and advanced. One of the biggest things that we have is our coaching staff who do a phenomenal job at mentoring the players on a regular basis with the training, the teaching, and the knowledge. We operate seven days a week. We offer over 30 sessions. And we're considered one of the top comprehensive basketball player development organizations in New England. And another key aspect that we do is that we have kids coming from all different areas, urban, suburban communities, uniting as one. And that's what makes VBG a phenomenal uh, organization that helps kids gain confidence, leadership, discipline, self-esteem. And if you have a chance, come down and see what we do at Visionary Basketball Group. VBG player athletes are rising stars in elementary, middle school, high school, and college basketball. We apply the same approach to training with every participant at VBG and produce players who are prepared for maximum performance. Visionary Basketball not only provides programs for individuals, we can also come to your town, school, or any institution to customize a structured program for your team or basketball organization. For more information, please log on to our website, www.visionarybasketball.com, or drop into our Athletic Performance Center at 152 Tremont Street, Melrose, Mass. BBG, complete your vision. Welcome back. Tonight, it's the Dickie V awesome baby return of Aztec Gino, one of the unofficial mascots of the Boston Celtics. Welcome. Good to be here, guys. And thanks for nice having me again. You. Always a pleasure. Great timing after that big win last night, huh? Unbelievable win last night. Like I, like I was tweeting, all my fans don't doubt the heart of a champion. And definitely the Celtics showed that last night, Ralph that we have the heart of a champion, guys. How about Garnett, huh? Is he something or what? Garnett is 17 rebounds. 17 rebounds, 18 rebounds. The last three games, he has been averaging phenomenal numbers. I think he's got the fountain of youth like you guys. <laughs> well, I hope they pack Paul Pierce in ice today to try to get him to be able to recover uh, for the next game tomorrow. Yeah, my worry, my worry is he played, Rivers played only seven players last night. He's not playing players like Lee, who I really like. Lee sprayed his ankle about a month ago. Sure. Came back, struggled a little, but he's quick. To me, he's their best guy, I feel. Other, you know, with Rondo out. Of course. And he's not playing, so, so I don't know. I wasn't happy with just seven players playing. What do you think? No, well, no, listen, I agree with that. We, you know, we need to have more players step up. But Terrence Williams had a good game last mm -hmm. night, Ralph. <laughs> Tell us Williams' run brought a lot of energy. Carmelo uh -huh. couldn't. I was, got him. I was wondering, when Doc went to Terrence Williams, he probably said, well, are you looking at me? I mean, <laughs> he was well, shocked. Well, yes. the good thing that Terrence Williams does is he breaks that press right away. He gets the ball over midcourt right exactly, away. Exactly, so yes. have plenty of time to run a, run a player, run their offense. You know, when some of the other players, Terry brings it up, he's going sideways with the dribble because yes. he really can't beat the defensive player. So by the time he gets over midcourt, there's like 10 seconds left in the shot clock. Exactly. And they're right. rushing their no, 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 I agree with that because, you know, you need to just, Doc always says, push it, push it. He likes guys to just explode, bring it up, and then, you know, get one of, you know, yeah. PSO Garnett or one of those other guys involved. Well, and the guy that earlier in the year, people were questioning his heart, whether he was healthy enough, whether he had the guts to make the plays down the stretch. Jeff Green, unbelievable last Uncle night. Uncle Jeff, or as we call him, Iron Man. What a guy. You know, what a, you know what? What a great, um, you know, great player, great addition for the Celtics. And good to see him recover from that terrible, yeah. you know, from that heart, um, mm -hmm. you know, problem he had. Yes, so. heart problem, and he seems to be coming along. And last night, hitting big threes, guys. Yeah. As a matter of fact, five players went over double figures in last night's game, and that I think was one of the key of the victory, guys. Yeah, Terry was hit five three pointers the too. Jet, Finally came alive. They said the jet engines were cold, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the jet came alive. <laughs> if he gets going, I mean, he's going to be a big plus for them if he can keep it going. They, or, they need a scoring. Or, defi or said, definitely. Yeah, somebody said he has the highest plus-minus of any player in the Celtics in the uh, series so far. 
Oh, yeah. Jeff, definitely. Jack, we need to, Jack to step up. You need Green yeah. to get going we early, too. We need Green too. to get going because, I mean, we, listen, guys, we can't just depend on Paul Pierce. You guys know right. this. I mean, Paul Pierce was doing too much in the series, playing, you know, bringing up the ball as Rondo is. You're not there. They were exploiting yeah. our guard position. Paul Pierce was rebounding. Paul Pierce was scoring. Assisting was too much on the captain. So, yeah. you know, we need other players to step up, guys. No. Obviously, Pierce is in a situation where he may or may not be back next year. We, you know, Danny Ainge was talking about that today. He says oh, it's, going to, it's going to be a very difficult uh, situation to be in for the Celtics. Well, he has one more year left, doesn't he? I think they have a possible buyout uh, available to his contract. So. Well, well, I, yeah, well, you know, I, I love Paul Pierce, especially what he has done for this franchise. And to be honest, guys, I would like to see Paul Pierce retire in green. It's like, oh. you know, it's like Larry Bird, you know, or, you know, you win, you know, you win trade Larry Bird, you know, after all he has done. I think he's the heart and soul of the Celtics. I mean, we know KG is also, you know, he brings a lot of intensity, but Paul Pierce, going to the garden and not seeing Paul Pierce yeah. would be very sad for a fan and a super fan like myself. Well, you know, if Paul Pierce goes, you know Garnett's going. Well, I think Garnett said he wouldn't play without Pierce. Yeah, he wouldn't play. And there you go. But why, yeah. why, if you're the Celtics, would you not want Paul Pierce back? Well, I, mean, I know that trade him. I know the guy they love is Jefferson, but Jefferson's not. Who are they gonna? Know, who are they gonna get? Who are gonna play with? So they want to give up. They want to give up Pierce's salary so they can get Jefferson in. Are I we think. talking Al Jefferson? Yeah, right. Ron? Al Jefferson. Oh yeah, he. You know, I think he'll be a good addition. But again, I would like to see Paul Pierce retire. My opinion, especially what he's done for this franchise, bringing a championship in 2008. I would love to see him retire in green, guys. Well, they just the, need, yeah, they need to work it out. I mean, he's one of the top 10, 20 scorers in NBA oh, history. And yes. He might be, if you had to have the ball, if you had to score the ball on one possession with any Celtic to make their own shot, Pierce is as good as anybody they've ever had. Yeah, what if you bring his minutes down to 28 minutes instead of 38, whatever right. it is? He, 28 minutes, he'd be really... That's a great point. Remember, guys, when we brought Jeff Green, the idea was for Jeff Green to start and have Paul Pierce come off the bench, and hopefully we get in at that point right. soon. But, I mean, I don't know what Ainge would be thinking about, because if they want to go start from new and get rid of, let Pierce go and KG, they both have contracts, number one. Well, I think, I think Garnett has a no-trade clause. Yeah, he has another year. Mistaken. But, I mean, who do they have to, to bring along? Well, you have you Sollinger have coming back. Yeah, he's a four. Small, yeah, he's a sort of undersized. Yeah, he's a four. He's not a three or he's no. not a one. Yes. He's not, he's a, and you got green. But right. what I'm saying, if you had someone else like as talented as green, then you may say, okay, maybe Pierce, maybe Pierce will want to retire or whatever. Sure. And you can be, but you're going to be hurting yourself by letting Pierce go. I mean, if they agree to it, the buyout of Pierce says this is it. I mean, well, it's going to hurt the team big time. Yeah, I, I don't. You know, I mean, well, that, having Pierce play 28 minutes. And Garnett playing 28 minutes. Oh, yeah, well, that, that's... With Salinger and Rondo back, even sure. though I'm not as crazy about Rondo as times. When he plays well within the team, I like him. When he starts getting cocky and he thinks he's the only one out well, there. Well, the, the, one of the big issues and disappointments has been Avery Bradley going into disappearing action. Bradley cannot play yeah, without well, you Rondo. Know, yeah, well, you know, the thing is with A.B., I think what happens is when he starts missing a few shots, psychologically it affects him. We all know he's a great defender, guys. What it is, I think. But he's he even losing that. Twelve this defender, yeah. you know, of the year. But the thing is, his offense. You know, he's a good defender. He should play off his defense because we need him to defend, especially in the series. But no one hurt him in the series. He's been playing point guard, and he's not a point guard. Exactly. If he I had agree. Rondo playing with him, he could be freelance like he what used to. Well, he doesn't get the points on those back cuts that he could. I mean, he just doesn't get that anymore. And but, there's nobody to pass him the ball. But I don't understand why he's playing ahead of Lee. To me, Lee is the best guy in the team. No, you love you like Courtney Lee. No, huh? I like him. He's, he's as quick as he's as quick as um, Bradley. Yes. He's very quick. Defensively, he's good, and I like the way he moves on offense. He has that pull-up jump shot. You know, he takes the ball to the hoop strong. Well, maybe he's hurt. I, I love his game, but I'm no, well, no, Rivers. I some that Rivers is down on him about something. I don't Courtney know. Courtney Lee, good player, but based on what happened last night with Terrence Williams, I like that. I think at this stage, we had to change it up a you bit. You need guys. Williams in there. Cause exactly. Just, he, After we lost, what were we, 0-3, we had to do something yeah. well, different the Celtics, to spark the team. The Celtics can come out and be loose. They have nothing to lose. They're exactly. Playing with, they're playing with house money right now. Yes. And meanwhile, the Knicks have to, the specter of the 
2007 Yankees on them. Now, what's, you know? your, jo what's your job there now? What are you doing to get the fans pumped up well, before my, the game? My job is just so you know, to get everyone all excited. Now, you all over the, the place. Ambience. Where are you most of the well, time? Well, actually, I've, I've toned down a bit now. I must be getting older. Before, I used to run all over. I call it the jungler route. Now, I sit in section 16, row F, and, you know, right there, I just do my stuff. Pump the crowd. They see me on the jumbotron. They get all excited. So, you know, it's just taking photos with the fans is always exciting. Yeah. The goal is just for all of the fans to come to the garden or the jungler and just to enjoy the experience. And I always like to say, guys, we have the best super fans in the NBA because they are a band of super fans. I'm just one of them. Now, Aztec Gino has a major social media presence, correct? Oh, yes. Aztec Gino is on Twitter. Please follow Aztec Gino, <laughs> Facebook, and also my website, AztecGino.com. You know, for, you know, for the latest photos of the games. I love to take photos at the games, run, and then I post it on my website. See, see them all the time. Yes, so, you know, it's always fun. And, uh, you know, the fans love you. The fans love me. I, you know, the fans, best fans in the NBA, guys, are uh, at the Celtics games. I always say we have the Boston as the best. Boston strong, guys. Boston best strong. fans in the NBA, yeah. guys. And very classy. Do, do you have any predictions for the rest of the series? Are we going to win? <laughs> like I said, you know, we're going to repeat the 2004 Red, what was it, the Red Sox Yankees? Yeah. When we came back, we will be the first team in the NBA to come back from 0-3 in a series. The Knicks wanted to make history. Guess what? They will make history when they go in the record books <laughs> run as a team that was defeated by the Boston that'd be, Celtics. That would be great to see. I'm oh, yes. You. I mean, I think we have momentum. And you know, you know what I didn't enjoy about this series was how the New York Knicks team and the fans were disrespecting us guys. How about with the black uniforms? Yeah, what's the story with that? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, Ron, what's the story with that? That's total disrespect, guys. Well, we were wondering if you had a black Aztec Gino costume that you'd be wearing tomorrow. Well, actually, I'm not wearing black. I'm wearing green <laughs> because we're so proud of our green heritage. All of the fans will be wearing green tomorrow because tomorrow is the burial. We have the funeral, T tomorrow is the burial. I'm not sure about the wake. When does the wake come? The Hopefully wake Sunday. <laughs> Hopefully Sunday night. When we close it out, but definitely we have momentum now. I think the men that shit, to, and the Celtics are showing their class. We are a team with a lot of pride, guys, a lot of tradition. Well, Garnett leads, I'll yeah, tell and you. We have shown, yeah, we have shown it. They, they woke up the sleeping giant Garnett's with all of the insults and all that that has occurred in the series. Our team finally woke up. Well, thank you very much to Aztec Gino, one of the lead mascots, one of the lead dogs in the NBA for coming to Let's Talk Sports. Yeah, <laughs> Let's Talk Sports, number one. We'll be right back. Always a pleasure, guys. Huh? You too, thanks. Hi, we're the volleyball team. And you're watching Let's Talk Sports. <laughs> Welcome back. We've been very fortunate this season in Melrose that uh, the community's had some fantastic teams uh, through many different sports. Uh, boys basketball got deep into the playoffs. Volleyball team won the state championship. And if you were trying to build up a program from scratch, there'd be some critical elements. Now, I guess the, the first one I'd talk about is communication, because anytime you want to have a successful human endeavor, you need great communication, and you need communication with players, with families, with the administration, with the entire community. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of other elements that go into, uh, what do you think, Ralph? Yeah, you have to show the players that you really care. The players and their families, you know, you really care about the program. And the players have to respect you. It's that simple. If you, if you show, I found that if you show the players that you really care about them and you want the best for them, I mean, they're not stupid. They know. They know if, if a coach is giving 100% to them and the team. And they'll give it back. Yeah, I think th that's right. Authenticity is so important. Um, you know, I remember years ago being over in Wakefield at a game, and uh, Wakefield coaches came up to me and said, Melrose is so hard to play against because they always have five players running down the floor at any time. And they said, most teams just don't have either the players or the willingness to do that. And, you know, the, 
you have to decide what kind of, for in basketball, for example, you have to decide what kind of style you're going to play. And, you know, we believe in up-tempo basketball. Yeah, especially with younger players. I mean, when they're high school kids, when they're still learning the game run. They're not, I mean, a lot, some coaches, the mistake they make is they think that the, when they get the kids that they're, they're, they're at their peak. If, and now we're going to work on plays, we're going to work on this, but we're not going to work on drills. We're not, I'm not going to drill them as much because they should be ready to play high school ball when they come up here. That's a huge mistake because play, the players, the progression keeps going. You know, the progression, it, it goes by seasons run. I mean, you end up, in this, you end up your season in the, in the wintertime just before the spring. Well, in the summertime, they've got to keep progressing and going in the right direction. And the, the players that really care about the game and respect the game, respect their coach and their, their teammates, they're going to work hard. They're going to yeah. do everything they can to be successful. Well, another, another important element that you have to have is great energy. For example, in the volleyball program, Coach Telly just brings tremendous energy to every practice, every game. The, the, the kids are always enthusiastic and eager to get out there, eager to work to become the best they, they can. And um, I just finished reading a book called The Compound Effect, where Darren Hardy talks about an exercise where you go into a room and tell people, I all want you to be as boring and subdued as you can possibly be. And naturally, you get a low energy environment. And then he says, now come in, greet everyone, big smile, give them a hug, slap them on the back, and what do you find in the room? You see great energy. So I think you're bringing energy and having players who can energize players around them is so important. Well, Coach Telly's a great coach. I mean, of all the coaches I've ever seen in high school, I mean, he, he's, he's one of the top ones, all right? And he, what I lo love about him is, and I've seen that with girls we've coached with our daughters, that during school, during the school day, when they walk by him in class or they have him in class, they're all excited. You know, they're all excited. I mean, they're just so positive, and that helps them with their schoolwork, you know, and then, and then they go to practice. They can't wait for practice. I mean, how many stories do we hear about our kids when they, they see Coach Telly in the corridor and they, they say, oh, we can't wait for practice today, you know? I mean, and they all look forward to it. They all look forward to being around him and their teammates because everything is so positive. He's a great coach, and they know he knows the game. They know they're going to get better, and they know by the end of the year they're going to be playing their best ball. Right. Another, another important edge that great programs have is teaching because basketball is a game that uh, you constantly learn during, during your life. I've probably learned more in the last five years coaching basketball than I did in my previous 40 years being around basketball. Because when you, when you watch the game, I watch how the team's ru running an offense what the defenders are doing to try to cope with that. Just, just studying how people try to defend the pick and roll, whether they do it well or not. Um, you know, Garnett's just fantastic at defending the pick well, and roll. In all the years I've watched um, girls basketball and boys basketball, high school, I mean, I watch the game as a coach. I see what the other coaches are doing to Melrose. I see what Melrose is trying to do. And I see, geez, if we did this and did that. So you learn an awful lot by just doing, watching that. And then it helps you coaching the younger girls because you're actually seeing, I mean, what I've seen is I've seen probably at least 50 coaches over the years in, in girls' high school basketball. I've seen how they've run their teams, you know, what they've done on offense and defense. I mean, like, again, if you're watching that, are you oh, talking sure. about experience? You know, obviously Kim Penny's teams at Reading run very sophisticated uh, style basketball. I think the Wilmington coach uh, did a great job with uh, his team last year. And another important aspect of basketball is being able to overcome adversity because things aren't going to always go your way. You're going to have illness, injury, tough games officiating. You don't shoot well or whatever. And I like what Celtics assistant coach Kevin Eastman says. Are you going to give up and give in or are you going to get up and get in? Well, you know, I've always said I've, to all my teams, the best teams, number one, if you're a great defensive team, you're going to be a great team. If you're a poor defensive team, you're going to be a poor team. It's that simple in basketball, high school, college, or pros. But like a lot of times, what I tell our girls is just go out and you've got to be able to mentally compete against the other team. You've got to raise your game. If somebody comes at you, you've got to be able to go at them even harder. And you know, my thinking is the people that identify the quickest and react on the control the quickest are the ones that are going to be successful. Right, and I think that... Part and parcel of that, as you, as you develop your program, at least in a running type sport, is 
you have to have superior conditioning. And it can't just be, well, we're, we're drilling and getting conditioning. You need to have objective measures of conditioning. So when people say, well, I'm in great shape. Well, you know, it, for example, uh, Lee Rose in his book, Winning Basketball Fundamentals, has three groups of players go off in a 24-minute drill. They have to run 200 meters, the, the guards, and then in a specified time. Then at 23 minutes, the forwards go. At 22 minutes, the centers go. And then the cycle res resets. So you're, and for example, the first day, it has to be the 200 meters in 44 seconds. And you, you do that eight times. So effectively, you run eight miles, eight uh, segments of 200 meters equal, equaling one mile of running. So you, if somebody says, well, I'm in great shape, but they can't do it, well, the coach can say, look, you know, everybody's got to be able to do this. And we understand that you know, if somebody's got asthma or some other limiting factor, that may be a, a mitigating circumstance. But if you want to play fast, you've got to be in shape. But, you know, it all comes down to the program, though, Ron, who's running the program. Look at, again, Coach Jelly. Look at this. You talk about positive. I mean, everybody in that program is positive. Everybody wants to play in that team. Everybody's doing everything they can to improve. Everything they can. I mean, they're playing at Puma. Every player, they know if they don't do it, they're not going to be on the team, number one, because it's so competitive. Right, it's gotten down now. And what and ba look at basketball. I mean, basketball right. doesn't have that right now. Right, people are playing, uh, you know, volleyball in seventh and eighth grade now because if you Even want, younger. if you right, if you want to become successful within the Melrose program, you just can't show up in high school without any volleyball experience because there's just so much competition from people. Uh, that have played and, and you saw that last year's team you see so many instinctive plays every game you see one or two pancake digs where somebody makes a diving play they have their hand out the ball hits pops up in the air you would never see that in the past because the, the players just hadn't played enough but you talk about importance right how important is that to the girls that are playing you know volleyball I mean how important it makes their whole high school career a terrific experience just you know I mean there's other things too but just being in a successful program like that, knowing that you've worked so hard to be one of the players that make the varsity, you know, and the JVs. You've got to right. work hard to make the JVs right. now, too. Right. Just, just to be on the varsity team now, I, I would say that Melrose is second team, the reserve players, who just, the six that didn't start, because you only put six on the floor, obviously, were probably the third or fourth best team in the whole Middlesex League, um, you know, right up there with, uh, you know, Redding. Really, I can't, can't think right. of other teams that were, were quite at that level. So th that's how good the program is right now. Right, and you, you hope the other sports. I mean, football, the program's good with Coach Football's Morris. Football's real good. Coach Morris does an excellent job of getting his team prepared. The kids come in. You know they've worked on their game. Well, they come back. They come in every year in great shape. The last several years, they've had tremendous well, football Hockey's teams. on the upswing with yeah. Coach Mirasolo. And the boys' basketball, they're great. And, you know, you hopefully... The girls' basketball gets back to the way it used to be. Start from the ball, you know, when the kids are playing youth basketball. You know, you want that family experience, and, you know, it can, they can definitely get it back. But, the, again, the problem is you got girls working extremely hard in volleyball, you know, in the offseason, and in basketball they're not working quite as summer. Well, summer. that's why I, I, when I mentioned uh, Annalisa, how can you really work on all your sports because they're so, hot, so different? Yeah, people like talking to her. People don't realize how great of an athlete she is. I mean, you're not, you're not talking about, you're talking about gymnastics, the toughest sport there is. And then she's doing track, she's doing the hurdles, and, and then right, to go to right. volleyball on the champion, state championship team, be one of the stars on that team, ma making sure she gets her work done. Yeah, truly, truly incredible. Those young kids can do just about anything, now. Now, there's some miscellaneous facts to, to talk about this week. Uh, I guess Tim Tebow always comes up. He's no longer a New York Jet. I'm sure that Mark Sanchez doesn't feel too badly about that. Of course, Sanchez now has to deal with another head case, Geno Smith. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Tebow, as a Patriot fan, I wouldn't mind seeing him pick him up. As He's long a as, football player. As long as he would be, be willing to do whatever it takes and not with the expectation that he was going to be competing for the quarterback right. job. If he came in and said, look, I'll be... Special a, teams. A special teams. Another tight end, fullback, safety, whatever. I mean, there's so many things that he can do, but I, I, don't, I don't think he'd be willing to do that. No. And finally, the Red Sox, 27 games into the season, 
best record in baseball. If I had a hat, I could eat it because I, I, I just, now, I'm still going to say 27 games doesn't make a whole season. It, it, Mike Napoli has been their best offensive player. That could continue. Daniel Nava has been their second best offensive player. Pedroia is starting to hit, yeah. too. But, but, but Nava has got his OPS over 900, which is incredible for a guy who probably could have been had for a good relief pitcher in a trade. Yeah, they have a good team. I mean, they're put together well. I mean, players love playing, you know, on that team. They get along well. They're pitching. We talked about it. The starting pitching's good. The bullpen's good. The one thing I'm a little concerned about with their bullpen is I think they're starting to feel it. I mean, you know, you know relief pitchers. If they throw too much, their arms get tired. Right. And you might want to go to, I think it's hittrackeronline.com, which is an ESPN site which shows you video of every major league home run. Those who saw Mike Napoli hit two last night, each of which had a crew of four and a hot meal on board. Uh, I'm Ron Sen, and thank you for watching. And I'm Ralph LaBella, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports.